All right, good morning. Welcome to the science seminar. This is our second to last science seminar. One more next week on um, topics in statistics. For all the math people or big statistics that want to come up with on next week. But today, we have a very enjoyable time welcoming back um, Nicholas Berger. I was trying to put the right word there. Yep. Nick, yeah, Bergren is how you would call him, right? Did general chemistry with me, so way back when, anything else? Just one or two. Just that, yeah, yeah. So that was what year? Uh, 2006 and 7. 2006 and 7. So just like we had John Pearson come back last time, um, Bergren's coming back this time, and a few years from now, you guys will be coming back. Yeah. You don't believe it now. But in a couple of years, you'll be up here telling us about how all the wonderful things that you've done since your time at Laterno and how well Laterno prepared you to do those things, right? Right. <laughs> okay. So, um, Nicholas is down at Galveston, and he's in a PhD program there, almost finished. He's got several papers already published. He's hoping to finish in December. Is that right? Yep. And he'll tell you about what he plans to do after that. With respect to saving the world and things. Well, I always have to save from the chemistry to destroy the brain. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So as, um, I want to remind you also that we'll be having lunch over in the corner cafe. We'll be up in that stage area. So hopefully you guys will come and greet your fellow alum. Right? These aren't just some foreign scientist coming from some strange state school someplace that you won't connect to. This guy, he's lived in the same places you have. He's taught on the same floor. And um, you can talk about your nanny experiences and all those sorts of things, right, that you have in common. And learn that there is life after Laterno. I know you guys are in the middle of the last parts of your semester here, and you're wondering, can I survive a couple more weeks? You know, there's that big Jin Kim final coming up, all this kind of stuff, right? But you can, and you will. And you will um, all do well with it, and you'll come back in a few years to tell us that you've been doing things. Let's welcome Nicholas here. Thanks, Dr. DeBoer. Um, so, as Dr. DeBoer said, I'm a PhD candidate at the uh, University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, um, and I'm going to talk to you guys about a specific part of my dissertation. Uh, which I've titled The Evolution and Decline of Western Equine Encephalitis Virus. Uh-oh. I'll just use the keyboard instead. Push the... There you go. Take this off. Sorry. Oh, that's the... Yeah, that's okay. my bad. Sorry. Okay. All right. So here's just a quick outline of the discussion that we'll be having. First off, we'll... You know, I'll kind of introduce the study of infectious disease at UTMB, which is a quite a unique uh, experience. Then we'll go over some background. I'll discuss the problem and my hypothesis, the study design that will find out whether this hypothesis is correct or not. We'll go over some methods, results, conclusions, and we'll go over future directions at the end. So I am what's called an experimental pathology student at UTMB. And this is a graduate program that's dedicated to the study of disease etiology processes and the development of therapeutics and vaccines, things of that sort. Uh, areas of classroom study include uh, some areas that you guys might have here, like cell biology, biochemistry, molecular biology, uh, bacteriology, virology, and then we go into the, the more specifics of immunology, physiology, pathology, and things like that. A uh, little bit more uh, succinct, the areas of research. Uh, we look at the mechanisms of infectious disease. Uh, we look at cellular and molecular pathology. We look at immunology, we study infectious disease ecology and evolution, which we'll be talking about today. And we also study arbovirology. For those of you who do not know what arbovirology is, it's a really simple term. All that means is it viruses that are transmitted by insects, uh, which is actually one of the, uh, UTMB is one of the havens for this kind of study. Uh, we're one of the, the reference centers for, for arboviruses. So anyways. Uh, here's just kind of an outline of the path of a PhD student at UTMB. Other degree programs may differ, but this is pretty basic from uh, what I've gathered from other PhD students. In the first year, you have some sort of curriculum. Uh, usually, you're covering like your basic courses, such as biochemistry, cell biology, and things like that. At UTMB, uh, other than choosing a lab 
straight off to do your research and what you do is you rotate uh, in four different labs for eight week periods to decide if you want to do your dissertation in that lab and if the lab wants you to begin with. You know, so it's kind of a mutual agreement on their parts. And once you decide that, you declare your, your lab at your specific program. In your second year, you uh, continue in your education in terms of classroom uh, work. You know, you have to take classes like grant writing, uh, pathobiology, tropical diseases. Some other ones are like bioterrorism and stuff like that. Uh, this actually is one of the hardest classes in all of grad school, um, but it's probably one of the most valuable skills if you want to be a scientist because you have to learn how to write and you have to learn how to beg for money. Um, so... Next, you take your preliminary examinations, which at UTMB, it's a, a mock uh, R21 grant, which is basically a seven-page grant. Uh, it cannot be anything like your dissertation topic, so you have to choose something completely separate, and you basically write that, you pass or fail, and then you have to defend it orally in front of a committee. Once you pass that, you write and approve your research proposal, and you select your dissertation committee. Once they approve your dissertation proposal, you enter to what's called candidacy. And after you've entered candidacy, all you have to do is finish your coursework, complete your proposal, and you can graduate. It's easier said than done sometimes, though. So, uh, working at UTMB with viruses and bacteria and stuff like that, you have to work in containment, right? So there's four different levels of biocontainment, uh, one through four. One is like something that you would find at a high school, all the way to four, which is something like you see in the movie uh, Contagion, which I think was shown here a few years ago. Um, where you wear the spacesuits and stuff like that. We have access to uh, level one through level four labs, and we have also have access, you see this A in front of BSL, which stands for uh, biosafety level, and the A stands for animals, so we can manipulate not only uh, cell culture things and molecular things, but animals as well. And also ACL, this stands for arthropod containment laboratories, so we can manipulate insects as well in order to kind of get a handle of these diseases. This is the only university in the entire United States that has level four labs that students can work in, um, which is quite a unique experience. I do not work in a level four lab. I work in a, in a level three lab. This is the building that, that we all work in. Uh, you can see these kind of where windows should be. This is where the BSL-4 is. And if we look in here, we can see through this porthole, you know, somebody in one of the spacesuits with their air hose connected to them, you know, doing some autoclaving. This is a standard BSL-2 lab right here. Here's some scientists doing important BSL-4 work. Uh, you can see they're wearing spacesuits. They have the air provided for them. This is an example of a BSL-3 lab where you have, uh, it's not a contained suit, but you have uh, purified air that's provided to you. Uh, and this is the, the lab that I work in with the particular virus that I work with. All right, so enough about that. Uh, what is a virus? So, Basically, I want to make sure that everybody's on a similar page here. Viruses generally can be categorized into two different, two different types. And this is categorized on the basis of their genetic information. You either have DNA viruses or you have RNA viruses. DNA viruses are generally pretty stable because DNA generally is pretty much are pretty stable in comparison to RNA. They can be either single or double-stranded. Uh, some examples include smallpox, which everybody's heard of, herpes virus, and parvovirus. Uh, RNA viruses mutate at a much more rapid rate, uh, at a rate of about 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the minus 4 uh, mutations uh, per generation. They can be single or double-stranded, and some examples include uh, HIV, influenza, polio, Ebola, uh, stuff like that, which you know everybody's heard of. Uh, you can see here that the different structures that kind of create a con the constellation of different viruses can be very uh, diverse. Um, however, we're going to be talking about one particular virus today, which is an envelope virus. You can also see here that the particular way that the genome is organized, whether it's single-stranded or double-stranded or circular, can be pretty diverse as well, especially uh, when you're talking about DNA viruses. All right, so this is an evolution talk, in a sense. So we're going to talk about the basics of RNA viral evolution. Um, all evolution means is change, right? And the way that a virus changes is by way of mutations. Now, we can measure the rates of these mutations because when you replicate a viral genome, the polymerase that does that is not completely faithful to the genome. Mutations arise and errors arise, and then through the sieve of what's referred to as natural selection, 
these mutations are either going to be detrimental, which most are, or they're going to provide some kind of positive effect for the virus, or they're not going to do anything. Um, so just to get kind of a, a, a basis on what kind of rates of mutation we're talking about, the human DNA polymerase without the proofreading pathways that are present in your cells has an error rate of about 10 to the minus 9. That's about one error per billion nucleotides. Okay? So you have about 3 billion nucleotides in your genome. So if you didn't have any kind of proofreading pathways in your cells, you would generate three mutations on average every single time your cells divided. However, because we have proofreading pathways in our cells, that number drops two orders of magnitude to 10 to the minus 11, which is a lot more faithful to the genome. That's why, you know, you know we were pretty stable in terms of our, our, our genetic structure, right? Um, however, viral RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, this is a polymerase that looks at an RNA template, and it creates another RNA based on that template, doesn't have the kind of proofreading that even this uh, polymerase has, so it has a much higher error rate at 10 to the minus 5 or 10 to the minus 4. So with that dis discussed, we're going to talk about the scale of the progeny. Now viruses are pretty unique in that these are some numbers from polio virus, which has kind of been the <coughs> prototypical RNA virus that people study when they talk about evolution. Uh, a single cell can produce about 10 to the 4 virus particles. That's 10,000 virus particles. One infected cell, 10,000 virus particles. An infected person can generate 10 to the 9 to about 10 to the 11 virus particles per day if they're infected with polio. That's 1 billion to 100 billion virus particles per day. So let's just kind of give some numbers to uh, give us context. Uh, if an RNA virus has about 10 kilobases, that's uh, 10 to the 4 base pairs, and it's uh, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase has an error rate of about 10 to the minus 5, that's about 1 in every 10 progeny genomes will have a mutation. So that means that of the low end of 10 to the 9 viral particles that are produced in that particular day, 10 to the, minus, or 10 to the 8, that's 100 million are going to have some mutation in some way, shape, or form. So with all these uh, par uh, viral particles with mutations, then comes the process of selection. So in addition to mutations, you have uh, instances of recombination, which is like stitching different genomes together, and reassortment, which uh, we're not going to talk about with our virus because reassortment happens when you have a segmented genome, you know, multiple parts of RNA, and they get reassorted into different <laughs> RNA molecules or different uh, virus particles. Anyways, but ultimately, selection is going to look at and see, in a sense, and I don't really like anthropomorphizing selection, but it's easy, so we'll do it anyways. Um, it's going to look and see what particles, you know, produce more progeny or what particles are deleterious, because if, if a particle has a deleterious mutation it's not able to produce progeny, then it's not going to, you know, uh, proceed in nature. However, non-deleterious ones, ones that, you know, might have no advantage, might, you know, go a little bit further in nature, but not a whole lot, but positively selected ones, ones that show an advantage, will persist. So, in summary, we have a fast generation time for RNA viruses. Uh, they have high rates of fecundity, which means a lot of progeny, and they have high rates of mutation in uh, reference to any other uh, organism on the planet. These attributes together allow for the effective study of RNA viruses in terms of evolution. So that's why uh, it's particularly easy to study this uh, with RNA viruses. All right. So we're going to talk about uh, Western equine encephalitis virus, which is the virus that I study, uh, which I'll refer to as Western because it's kind of a mouthful. Um, so... This is in the genus Alphavirus, uh, the family Togaviridae, and what that means is it's a mosquito transmitted virus. We'll talk more about the transmission cycle in a moment. But its genome is single-stranded positive sense RNA. It has 11.5 kilobases of, of genetic information. You can see that the virion structure is spherical, 
The RNA, which is here in the middle, is encased in an icosahedral capsid protein structure. So this basically just coats the RNA. Around the capsid, you have a lipid bilayer membrane that's, produced, that's generated when the virus buds off of a cell. And transversing this lipid bilayer membrane and actually connecting into the capsid is, are these uh, E1 and E2 glycoproteins, which actually mediate the entrance. You know, they kind of connect with the right receptors on a cell and mediate that entry into the cell that it's going to infect. So this is a genome. I said earlier that it's positive sense. What that means is that it has a five prime cap and a polyadenylated tail. For those of you, of you that remember uh, gen bio or genetics or cell biology or whatever, you recognize that this mimics an mRNA molecule, which means the second that this molecule is exposed in the cytosol, it starts, ma it start making, it starts making uh, non-structural proteins right here, which will then aid in the synthesis of more RNA and the synthesis of more of these structural proteins which are controlled on this subgenomic promoter. All right, so this is a basic diagram of the life cycle of Western inside of a cell. Uh, it enters the cell via receptor-mediated endocytosis. Um, for those of you who might remember what endocytosis is, uh, they might connect with the lysosome, which is designed for the cell to kill whatever's in that, that vesicle. However, these viruses have developed this really pernicious way of that lowering of pH causes these proteins to unfold and release the RNA into the cell, which allows it to then produce its protein. So that's the mechanism with which it enters the cell. You have this pretty complicated mechanism of producing protein and more mRNA, followed by uh, assembly and then budding of the mature uh, viral particle from the cell. This is the transmission cycle for uh, Western. It is a mosquito-transmitted virus. It's transmitted primarily by the vector. Uh, we refer to mosquitoes as the vector because they take the virus from one point and they move it to another point. So, you know, you can kind of correlate it to the, the physics term a little bit. Um, but anyways, Culex tarsalis is the main vector, and it primarily feeds on uh, passiform birds and other ornithids. Passiform birds are what's referred to as perching birds. So, you, you know, it's springtime and you hear all the house sparrows around, the finches and things like that. That's the reservoir host for this virus. Um, it can also spill over into uh, other birds like quail and chickens and things like that. In a pretty bad cycle or summer cycle where uh, a lot of birds are infected and a lot of mosquitoes are infected, uh, 80s species mosquitoes, which are the mosquitoes that you, you know, you don't like, uh, are going to possibly bite birds and become infected and then infect other mammals and create a, a replication cycle there. One important thing to remember when you're talking about these transmission cycles is that in order for uh, a reservoir host to be considered just that, a reservoir host, is that there has to be, once the reservoir host is infected, virus produced in the organism that is then let out into the blood at a certain level to where if another mosquito were to bite it, that mosquito would then become infected and transmit the virus further. Uh, this is what we refer to as a viremia. Uh, so these, all these animals produce a viremia. However, there are two dead end hosts, that is humans. We produce a transient viremia that's not high enough for mosquitoes to become infected, although we get severely ill when infected with this virus, usually, uh, and horses which uh, are sp uh, specifically susceptible to this virus. Uh, however, uh, there's some debate whether or not there's specific dead-end hosts, but um, besides some esoteric literature from the 1940s, that's beside the point. So dogmatically, they're dead-end hosts, but I beg to differ. Anyways, uh, so this is what the clinical symptoms of Western looks like. It can range from asymptomatic, where you get bit, the virus gets in you, and your immune system just takes care of it really well. You can have a mild febrile illness, which is flu-like, you know, achy, stuff like that, uh, fever. Or you can have mild to severe encephalitis. Encephalitis means that the brain compartment is swelling. So your brain is actually producing inflammation, which is causing the brain to swell, and pressure on the, the skull and things like that. Uh, it can lead to coma and death in some cases. The incubation period is about 2 to 10 days. Uh, so you can have sudden onset set of headache, followed by dizziness, chills, myalgia, malaise. This can be followed uh, into more neurological symptoms like tremors, irritability, photophobia, neck stiffness. 
<clears throat> Stupor or coma can develop in less than 10% of the cases and respiratory failure in some. And the case fatality rate overall is about 4%. This is skewed towards individuals that are greater than 75 years of age because of usually compromised immune systems. However, an important thing to note is that mild to severe neurological sequelae can appear in survivors. What sequelae means is after effects of the disease. So if you've had an infection in your brain and it's swollen and it's been bad, right, you can have you know, some residual damage that, been, that has been done to your brain that could require medical care for the rest of your life um, in some uh, way, shape, or form. So this is a pretty bad virus. And the, the human system, symptoms uh, are similar to that in horses, although the case fatality rate is much higher in horses. All right, so let's look at the, uh, some old evolutionary history that's been done on the virus. Uh, you can see that the virus usually groups into group A and group B. These isolates right here are from South America and Cuba and Russia. So these are the group A and the group B isolates are all North American isolates, which we'll be concentrating on today. I apologize for the graininess of this, this picture, but it's an old article and they didn't have high-res photos back then. So just suffice it to say you have some older isolates grouping into group A and some more recent isolates grouping into group B. Also, uh, it's interesting to note that usually you don't have maintenance of a specific uh, strain in a particular area, but because birds transmit it, you know, you have pretty good geographical spread and mixing of the virus over the country. All right, so the history and epidemiology of Western, uh, it was discovered in the San Joaquin Valley, which is kind of Southern California in 1930. There's an interesting story behind this. So a horse, or like a rancher, had a horse that died, and there was a vet by the name of Dr. Myers. And he was really interested why this horse died, because this horse was exhibiting really weird symptoms. It was circling with its head on the ground, pushing against posts. Finally, it died. Now, this vet, Dr. Myers, wanted to take this horse for examination, but the owner wouldn't allow it. He wanted to give the horse a burial or something like that. So at night, this veterinarian comes in, I'm not kidding, no, this veterinarian comes in, takes the horse's head, puts it in the back of his pickup truck, drives off, the rancher is chasing him with a shotgun. You know, welcome to Southern California in the 1930s, right? So not only has this man produced, you know, a good amount of, you know, scientific, uh, productivity, but he's also kind of a, an interesting man, apparently, too. <laughs> so, anyways, I don't think he had any jail time for this, which is probably a good thing, but anyways. So the largest outbreak was in 1941. Uh, that occurred in Midwestern North America, where 3,400 plus human cases occurred. Hundreds of thousands of horses died as a result of this uh, epidemic. And you can understand... Um, you know, even though the agriculture is being transformed into more industrialized form, the death of an agricultural animal like horses in these areas that rely on that during this time was extremely economically debilitating. However, something very interesting has happened with this virus. Uh, recent epidemiology has shown that there's only been 63 human cases between the years of 1964 and 1987. Only five human cases have been documented since 1987, and the last human case in the U.S. has been in 1999. However, when we look in mosquitoes, we still find the virus, which is really interesting because if it's not infecting people and it's still being transmitted in nature, then something has had to happen, right? Now, just to, just to kind of make a point, how many of you guys have heard of this virus before? A few, you know, maybe horse owners or something, people who are biologists, right? Um, most people that I encounter have not heard about this virus at all, which indicates you know, the, the extent to which it's not a factor anymore in, in our scope of health, right? All right, so <clears throat> several studies have tried to figure out this question, you know, because it's really interesting, and if you understand why this is happening, you can understand mechanisms by which you can make a virus uh, ultimately decline, hopefully. So... <clears throat> In short, five studies have tried to do this, all failed. 
Um, this is because they didn't use, in my opinion, well-controlled experiments. They didn't um, uh, choose the viruses, the viral strains well, um, and you had some, some problems with the models that they chose to study it in. <clears throat> However, you know, there's little intimations in the literature. It's, oh, they got so close. You know, they, they got so close to, like, finding out why, but, you know, there was just something wrong with their experimental protocol that precluded them from that. <clears throat> so, in short, some improvements are needed. So, uh, some improvements that are needed are uh, what I refer to as a non-arbitrary method for choosing strains, which this talk is going to talk about, the phylogenetic analysis for choosing these different strains and mutations that could have altered the virus in different ways and uh, using background noise in different strains. And what that refers to is if you have one strain of a virus and another strain, one mutation might be phylogenetically significant in connecting those lineage, but th there's going to be other mutations there that might affect your results, and that's what I refer to as background noise in terms of the mutations. So the problem, as I've discussed, is that Western is still found circulating in its enzootic areas, and this is evidenced by mosquito pools in California and Texas. Um, however, it's dropped off precipitously for the past 50 years. I propose that Western has acquired specific mutations that have resulted in altered fitness in its enzootic host, which is the natural host reservoirs for it, so the birds and the mosquitoes, and or virulence, which is the severity of disease in mammals. So I am accomplishing this by, three, by the execution of three separate specific aims. The first is to collect a large selection of 30 Western isolates and sequence their whole genomes. Uh, before now, only partial genomes have been sequenced, so I'm sequencing all of it. Excuse me. And doing some uh, phylogenetic analyses, looking at selection pressures, um, and conserved mutations. A uh, specific aim two is to characterize the found mutations in the enzootic host, and specific aim three is to look at the mutations in the um, mammalian models that we have for virulence. This talk we're going to concentrate on specific aim one. Two and three are actually underway uh, currently. So we're going to talk about what, how you measure viral evolution, and that's by way of phylogenetics. Phylogeny is the evolutionary history of a species or group or a related species, and the discipline of studying this is called phylogenetics, where phylogenetics looks specifically at genetic information. We're not looking at phenotypic information like taxonomists or something like that. We're only looking at the nucleotide information. And we use phylogenetic trees, which I'm sure you've seen, other than that, that, that pixelated one before. Uh, to represent our findings. The first step to do this is you have to sequence your, your stuff and your, your information, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But once you have sequences, you have to align it because these algorithms that we're going to run it through uh, compare apples to apples, essentially. So you have to align your data. And you can even see that in the alignment, you know, there's certain mutations. So these strains have C, that one has T, right? There's a G to A right there, different things like that. So we're going to push this information through these algorithms which are then going to give us what's referred to as the most likely tree. So we choose an algorithm that's going to search what we call tree space. So like I said, we're trying to find the most probable tree, the most likely tree, the most reasonable tree. Um, and that's what we refer to as in searching tree space. And there's different models that we can use. Suffice it to say, they kind of go into two different categories of statistical measures. Either frequentist, which is what a lot of you guys are probably uh, familiar with, at least I was, before I got introduced to this topic of phylogenetics, where, you know, you have your, your alternative hypotheses and your null hypotheses, and you test those through a uh, particular tests. And then you have your Bayesian statisticians, and your Bayesian statistical tests. And what these do is you set a prior, which you think that, you know, I think that this is going to be that, and then you set a range around that, and you see if that fits within that range. Uh, it's a little esoteric, but maybe the guy next week will talk about Bayesian statistics. I don't know. Maybe. maybe. So, be interesting. Back. Yeah, I, I doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, uh, so basically, over the past few years, this Mont Markov chain Monte Carlo system has been uh, promoted as the best, essentially, and it uses a Bayesian statistical framework to accomplish that. I'm not going to get into the specifics. Um, so, 
But first, you need to collect your sequences. And this is a specific workflow that I followed. I collected isolates from the World Reference Center for Emerging Viruses and Arboviruses, which is uh, curated at UTMB. Uh, my outside committee member, Dr. Risen from UC Davis, provided isolates of it. The Texas Department of State Health Services provided isolates, and we also have uh, one of the largest collection of Western isolates in our laboratory, so we made use of that as well. Uh, I'm not going to go over the specifics of the workflow with how I sequenced all these viruses, but if you want to talk about it, uh, I'm happy to. Um, essentially, you have to grow these cells, or grow the virus, you have to precipitate the virus and concentrate it, and then you have to work some molecular magic to generate uh, DNA amplicons that are at a concentration that you can sequence, and then you run them on a Sanger sequencer, which, if I remember right, you should have learned about that in Biology 1. So whether or not you remember it is, you know, whatever. Anyways, uh, so this is, these are the uh, isolates that I've selected. The isolates are diverse in geography, they're diverse in time, all the way from the original 1930 isolate all the way to the 2000s. And they're diverse in terms of the host with, with which they were collected from. They're also generally skewed to what we call a low passage history. In order to propagate these viruses in the lab, you have to pass them through some kind of biological material. So you get amplification and you can store it. But we don't want to be measuring the evolutionary effects of passage history, right? So we want the lowest passage history possible because you can heavily mutate a virus if you passage it heavily in a particular um, cell line or organism. All right, so let's get into the data. So the genetic diversity that we found is that the Western <laughs> genome is highly conserved. The E2 gene, which is an envelope glycoprotein, is the most highly divergent from about 95% to about 97% amino acid divergence. Um, ultimately, the NSP1 was the most highly conserved at about 98.7% nucleotide divergence, 99.2 amino acid divergence to about 100 Looking at the Bayesian, or the, the tree, we used an MCMC analysis. This nucleotide substitution model, what this means is some of you may know that in order to change from one nucleotide to another, it's easier, right? We call these transversions and transitions, right? So what this does is this model takes into account different rates of nucleotide transitions and transversions and, and the relative difficulty of that in the genome. Um, and then this is just our due diligence showing due diligence in showing that we were able to reach convergence, which means that the program was able to find the most likely tree. And this is the generated tree. You see group A down here like before, and you see group B right here uh, like before in that one tree. However, an interesting note that gr the group B isolates seem to be uh, segmented into three separate groups. Now, we looked at this and we were like, well, that's interesting. Um, so we wanted to see if you know, time, if you could uh, slave this to time in the sense where you could see if time was allowing for different groups to emerge and other groups to diverge from that and push other groups out of the population. Um, so what we did for that is we ran a beast analysis. I don't expect you guys to know what that is, but other than if you look on here, this little scale, it says 0.01 is a scale for these lines right here, and what this measures is nucleotide divergence. What the BEAST analysis does, which I'll show you right here, slaves the y-axis to time rather than nucleotide divergence. So if I look at this 1978 isolate right here, and I follow it down on the y-axis, you have 1978 right there. If I look at 1961 right there, you follow it down 1961. Now, what changes is the length that, or the, the distance with which these nodes intersect. So if we follow it down, we can say that with pretty good confidence that these nodes diverged, or these two strains diverged around 1956. Okay, so that's kind of how this tree works. These blue lines that you see on some of these nodes are 95% confidence intervals, so you can kind of shift them, and it gives you an idea when they diverged. And what you see is a pattern of emergence of a group and displacement of the previous group. So group B2 emerged from group B1 and displaced it to where it's no longer circulating. Finally, group B3 emerged out of group B2 and displaced it 
out of circulation where it's the only currently circulating lineage that we can find. This is what's referred to as a Bayesian skyline plot. All this shows is the relative genetic diversity over time. So what you see is a small increase in genetic diversity followed by a plateau and a decrease. And this indeed correlates with the uh, inclusion of group B2 and group B3 co-circulating around the 70s and 60s and the subsequent purification of group B3 in the 1980s and the ultimate purification in the 90s and 2000s, which results in this decrease. Because the uh, Western is so homogenous, um, we, our 95% confidence intervals are pretty far spaced out apart, uh, but um, it's, it's still acceptable, essentially, because the, the tree supports the same findings. All right, so the next thing we did was we wanted to find out what mutations define internal branching patterns, not just mutations that occur sporadically, but mutations that help define the specific nodes of these viruses, of the major groups of this virus. So we found six in all, one in NSP3, one in NSP4, two in Capsid, one in E2, and one in E1. Uh, interestingly enough, all these codon positions are in the second or the first. Uh, it's interesting that we got some first codon positions, which is generally a little bit more faithful. And uh, just by nature of the way these viruses mutate, uh, they're less likely to happen. So this indicates possible positive selection. You can see that this NSP3 mutation, which is a threonine to isoleucine, occurs between the years 1943 and 54, and this helps uh, determine the, the divergence from group B2 to group B1. We have NSP4, which is an asparagine to serine, which occurs around the same time, and again allows for the divergence of group B1 to group B2. This is a very interesting example. This is a capsid mutation at position 89, and this is an example of what we call convergent evolution two of the same evolutionary events happening independently of each other, right? So this mutation happened independently in two separate lineages um, around the same time, but not precisely the same time. This is a strong indication of positive selection because if two lineages are finding, hey, this mutation seems to be working out for us, then this gives us a little bit more you know, assurance that, hey, this could possibly be positive selected. So finally, we have an example of continuous evolution in the capsid 250 position. This is a lysine down here. It mutates into an arginine and then further mutates into a tryptophan in group 3. Finally, or second to finally, we have alanine to threonine in E2. This is a 1943 to 1947. This occurs down here. Helps diverge group B1 from group B2. And finally, E1, which is a threonine to serine. This occurs in the 40s. And again, group B1 to group B2, a lot like what we've been seeing recently, right? So what are our conclusions from this analysis? Our conclusions are that we're hypothesizing that group 1 is most likely distinct. Uh, ultimately, group B has been separated into three separate uh, lineages, and group B is the most recent currently circulating linea lineage of Western. So here's group B3 circulating now. We're not quite sure about group B2, but we're pretty confident in saying that group B1 has gone bye-bye, right? Furthermore, we're pretty certain that since none of the recent isolates grouped with group A, uh, we can kind of express our certainty with the literature that it indeed has become extinct. So group B A goes bye-bye as well. All right, so we found six key non-synonymous mutations. What does non-synonymous mean? Non-synonymous means non-silent. Uh, you can have a mutation, but that doesn't necessarily translate into a change in amino acids. This just means that we have six mutations that change the amino acid structure of these, this virus uh, that define internal branching patterns. <clears throat> and the majority of mutations occur between 1945 and 1971. This correlates with the plateau of genetic diversity that we found with the subsequent uh, decline and purification of group B B3. And we saw this in our skyline analysis. And finally, uh, yeah, I just said that. We, this also correlates to the reduction in the prevalence of group B3. All right, so we also ran some selection pressure analysis. What this does is all these analysis do is they show whether your genome or specific sites in your genome are under positive selection or negative selection. Okay, negative selection means you have deleterious mutations being accumulated, and the virus is kind of purifying those out because it doesn't do any good to the virus. 
positive selection are like mutations that, you know, have an advantage. It's like, hey, I'm going to perpetuate this because, you know, why wouldn't you? Uh, so it helps it, you know, either replicate in nature or in some cycle or something like that. So ultimately, we found that the uh, whole genome is under what's referred to as negative selection. This is gained by doing what's called a DNDS ratio, which is the ratio of non-synonymous, which we referred to as these are silent or non-silent mutations to silent mutations, and that's 0.145. When it's below one, you have negative selection going on, which means it's purifying out most mutations. Finally, one <clears throat> mutation showed strong positive selection. However, this occurs sporadically in different lineages, indicating that it's not phylogenetically significant, although it may be significant for the virus. Um, and all the mutations that we found are undergoing what's referred to as positive selection. However, the p-values didn't quite meet muster. But there's something that you should know about most of these algorithms, and right now is that they're not the best. So these give us indications. Anytime you do these, or these uh, computational approaches, you must, you must verify it with empirical experimental evidence. These give you ideas to springboard off of, and you must test them. You cannot say, okay, I'm done, you know, I figured it out, the computer spit out the answer, and I'm done. No. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time to get into the in vivo, in vivo and in vitro testing, um, which is currently being done now, but getting some interesting results. Uh, so what are our conclusions? Our conclusions are that the Western genome is highly conserved. Uh, our phylogenetic analysis reveals the presence of three sublineages in group B and group B. Only group B3 is the re most recently found currently circulating lineage. We found six key non-synonymous mutations that helped define the internal branching patterns for the phylogeny that we developed. These mutations occur between uh, the years 1945 and 71, which correlates with all the stuff that we found, the plateau of genetic diversity and the subsequent decline. In the si skyline analysis, these mutations that we found may possibly be under positive selection. And however, most of the genome is under negative selection uh, pressure. So some future directions. Uh, we have taken all these mutations and we have cloned them into a recent strain of Western that we have in what's called an infectious clone. Um, and we're going to, that allows us to um, very, in a controlled environment, express only certain mutations that we want to express and test different mutations. Uh, so those viruses have been made and they are currently being studied in terms of growth kinetics, and we're running what's called co competitive fitness assays in uh, the mosquito and the house sparrow to find out if one virus with the mutation has a more competitive advantage over the virus without the mutation. So we're trying to figure that out and elucidate that. Finally, we're currently doing virulence assays uh, in the mammalian disease model, which we're using the Syrian golden hamster, which is the probably the best model for Western, uh, to determine if these mutations have any effect on virulence in the, in the disease model. Um, with that, I would like to thank uh, my lab, which is run uh, by Dr. Scott Weaver. Um, Jonathan August, uh, Shannon Rossi are both postdocs, or Shannon's a research scientist now, in our lab, which, is, which have helped me significant with it, significantly with this project. Kenneth Plant is a previous graduate student who is who's also helped. Uh, he's at the uh, uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill right now. Um, and finally, our, our technicians that, you know, they keep the lab running, and we wouldn't be able to do anything without them. Fi and also, Dr. Forrester, who has her own lab at UTMB, has also helped with the phylogenetics. Also, my supervisory committee, Dr. Weaver, who the chair of, is um, Dr. Aronson, Tesh, Benti, Beasley. Dr. Tesh provided the isolates from the World Reference Center. Dr. Risen provided isolates as well. Uh, Mary Anton from the Texas Department of State Health Services provided isolates that were from Texas, uh, the recent isolates that were from Texas. And finally, the training grant that not only supports part of this research, but also my salary um, that is provided through the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. So with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. I think we have a little bit of time. Yeah. So, thank you. Chemistry, computer.
Computer science, statistics, yep. a little bit of biology, I guess. A little bit. So, questions from the audience? Yeah. If you can figure out what exactly changed so it's not a problem for humans anymore, do you think you can induce that change in any types of viruses? Yeah, that's the idea. You know, we're thinking that some kind of uh, ecological impact has happened or change has happened such that it's altered the virus's, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, patterns of, of transmission. My hypothesis is that horses, while they are generally a dead-end host, develop a low-level viremia and actually participate in these epidemics as viremic hosts, which infect more mosquitoes. There was a horse vaccine introduced in the 1950s uh, that most horses, if you're a horse owner, they get inoculated with. I think it's like a Western, Eastern, and then some kind of bacterial toxin or antitoxin or something. But anyways, so if you take out that whole population, which is usually, you know, centered it around humans too, you know, you can alter the pressures on the virus to just not worry about horses anymore because they're not going to be replicating in them. So you could have this drift of the virus towards normal and zootic host where it doesn't enter humans anymore. So with that, you know, hopefully we can apply it to other viruses. You know, maybe something, if we can get... Um, enough coverage of, of horses or a better vaccine for horses or even for humans with West Nile virus, you know, that's something that's applicable and, and other viruses as well that are transmitted by mosquitoes. Yeah. Yeah. The life cycle of this particular virus looks pretty complicated in the diagram. Yeah. The are there other viruses for which they have a similarly complicated cycle that we just don't think about all the time or is that unusual? As a no, this is very usual for arboviruses, for mosquito transmitted viruses. So, uh, if you've heard of dengue virus, uh, you've heard of uh, yellow fever, um, St. Louis encephalitis, which is present around here, Japanese encephalitis, um, are all transmitted by similar uh, transmission cycles. And one of, like, I mean, all of them differ in some way, shape, or form. Like, humans are dead and host, but for dengue virus and, and an, a virus that's actually becoming epidemic in the Caribbean right now, chikungunya virus, you can establish an urban cycle where humans become viremic and urban mosquitoes bite them, become infected, and you have your own self-sustained cycle within the city. So these complicated transmission cycles are pretty, pretty common, and this is actually one of the, the, the more less complicated transmission cycles. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you. I note that uh, there is, I don't know whether I have taken note of a shift from 1997 to 2002, mm -hmm. when the B3, it appears like there is another group that's emerging. Right, from B3. Yeah, from B3. Right. Have you tried to look specifically at maybe some kind of changes between, within just the B3? Right, we, we have. Uh, so we don't find many uh, non-synonymous mutations that are causing that divergence, whatever it may be, but they are silent mutations that are causing that particular divergence from group B3. Uh, we're trying to get some more isolates to kind of complete the phylogeny a little bit more and continue the story. Um, but right now, uh, because of various like budget cuts in Texas, they're not collecting mosquitoes anymore. Uh, California, um, they're only doing what's called, well, Texas is doing this too, but most states are only doing what's called a zero surveys. So they're only testing for antigen. They're not trying to isolate virus from mosquito pools. So we're having a, a really hard time getting viruses, but that's a story that we would like to continue. And question. this one is essentially what you have sequenced. Don't we have some references in the gene bank which could boost up the phylogenetic? Yeah, so all of, all of what you saw are all the whole genomes that we have, period. So there were five ones that were previously published, mm -hmm. and then every, every single other one, which are uploaded on GeneBank now, are provided in the, from this study specifically. So... First, want to say how proud I am of the work you're doing today, and uh, that you're a maternal graduate. And, uh, thank you so much for coming back and sharing with us. Um, my question for you, since most of us will not be going to lunch here to talk with you more, but I, I kind of like for you to just to share briefly what, as an undergraduate, you need to be doing, the kinds of things you need to be doing if you want to end up doing what you're doing today. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, studying biology is is so much fun. Like, I, I enjoy every moment of it. Like, understanding the processes of living organisms and stuff like that is awesome. Um, 
one thing that I would cultivate as an undergraduate is not necessarily learning the rote information. Don't get me wrong, that's necessary and you have to do it. But you must, if you want to do, if you want to go into a research profession or even if you want to be a clinician or something like that, you must cultivate your ability to think critically and your ability to ask questions. And your, I mean, just your ability to like take things the next step. It's like, okay, what, where, where is this line of logic going? Um, to me, that's the most important skill as a scientist um, that I think is the most important to cultivate because you know, it's not all just rote information. You have to be able to take that information, apply it, and you don't only have to ha apply it, but you have to synthesize it into other areas of learning, too, and be able to think critically and ask good questions. So, yeah. Wow, well, that sounds like a good note to end upon, but I want to remind you that we will be at the Corner Cafe, so if you want to ask about mapping up human genomes and things like this, those will be interesting topics that come up at lunch. We'll see you up in the stage area. Otherwise, see you next week. Thank you for talking about statistics.